that our users can, can use? And the answer came to us by accident. Um, we had Gillette approach us about creating a channel dedicated to grooming. Um, we have Armando, who's here in the audience today. He knocked on my office door and he said, Rick, we're going to create a channel with only grooming content and we're going to create hundreds of articles <laughs> over the next year. And I replied to him, are you crazy? <laughs> Who the hell wants to read that much content about grooming? And the reality is, is that there are a lot of people that want to read the content. They don't want to read about grooming itself, the exercise of, of shaving, but they want to read about it in the context of a, man, a, a man's overall appearance. So, for example, if I'm here in front of you, you're looking at my voice, you're looking at my posture, you're looking at my confidence, you're looking at all sorts of factors. The grooming is only one of many different elements. So, the way we were able to inject grooming content was talking about subjects like the rules of etiquette or the traits of the world's most charismatic men, and it was a much more natural fit. But that was our answer. It's not the only answer. Um, our competitors are doing some very interesting things as well, and they have their, their own responses to, to this dilemma. Um, the person that I think is, or the site that's, I think, doing a really good job in terms of mixing e-commerce and editorial is Mr. Porter. And to my surprise, Gucci, in the uh, tablet world, is actually doing some very innovative things with their Gucci style app in terms of user interface. But for the purposes of today, what I wanted to focus on is the lessons that we learned in terms of targeting uh, men with uh, fashion content. And the first lesson is, fashion has to be presented as a means to an end. And what this means is, talking about fashion for fashion's sake is not gonna work. It could work for a small segment of the male population, but the vast majority of people will tune out. You have to sell it as part of a lifestyle. And the most effective way is to actually sell it as a tool to an end goal. So if I want to move up the corporate ladder and impress my boss, or if I want to impress a girl on a date, or if I have low self-esteem and I want to improve my confidence, if you present fashion as being a tool to achieve these things, it's much more effective. Let me give you an example of a headline. This headline here, talking about fuchsia blazers, you know, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> reality is, is most guys don't care, you know. They don't care what color comes in, it doesn't matter if it's pink or blue or yellow. They do care if that color says something about them. And that's the big difference, because all of a sudden it's about me, and about my image to the rest of the world. The second lesson that we've learned is that having a credible source, for example, a fashion expert write content is fantastic. But if they don't give you practical advice, it doesn't mean anything. So let me tell you a story about Sylvester Stallone. Um, Sylvester Stallone wrote a career article for us a couple of years ago. And I was convinced that this article was going to do great. I mean, it's Sylvester Stallone. Every guy loves Stallone, right? Well, the problem is, is that this Stallone doesn't really know much about career advice. And <laughs> didn't have very practical tips. And so this article actually bombed. And it bombed because he had one of these three things. He didn't have all three. He was a celebrity, but he had no credibility. He was, like I said, not a, a career consultant. And he didn't even have influence because, you know, if it was Richard Branson, maybe he'd pay attention, but, you know, it's a rookie. <laughs> so, the maxim here is, is actually straightforward. Practical advice will always trump impractical advice. And it's shocking to me you know, this is actually very obvious. You're saying to yourself, of course, Rick, you know, well, but it's not obvious. Um, you'll see oftentimes fashion content is presented as, you'll ask a designer a question, what's your inspiration? And in certain contexts, that makes a lot of sense asking that question, but in terms of the takeaway, um, it's very hard for a man to sort of uh, take the practical advice that he needs and apply whatever that inspiration is. Uh, if you look at the example of exfoliation. Actually, that's a good one. Um, you uh, speak to most men, you say the word exfoliation, Rami, what, what do you say? Right. Blank stare, like he's doing me. <laughs> if you present exfoliation as part of a routine, as part of a process, so um, you go to the gym, and then you take a shower, and then you uh, wash your hair, and you shave, and then you exfoliate, all of a sudden, guys understand the concept more because they know they could integrate it into the daily routine, right? Okay. 
Lesson number three, there is an incredible um, appetite for anything classic. Like, whether it's returned to the way the 60s uh, operated, uh, Sinatra, it doesn't matter. And a lot of the credit today is going to, to Mad Men. They've inspired this love affair with nostalgia, and you know, myself included. And they've introduced a lot of great things. And being a city that uh, we know how much we love our San Gasset, the three martini lunch is something that we welcome with open arms. <laughs> but it was very interesting to us, why, why the 60s? Why not the 70s or 80s or another era? And so we actually asked our users, and they gave us a very interesting response. They said that they felt that today, because the world felt a lot more casual, that uh, things were more democratic, that everything was politically correct, that even the authoritarian father figure that uh, a lot of us grew up with doesn't exist. You know, today you're a dad and you're telling your kids they're special all the time. And especially in the fashion world, um, where everything is so free and creative, for a lot of guys, that is very, very scary. And so the classics was actually, a, a, or any content uh, around things that were classic, was actually a throwback to an era where there were rules. Um, where there was structure, where there was sort of a procedure. Think about it in terms of um, tailoring a suit. It's almost scientific, right? You have to measure. There's a science, there's a process that hasn't changed, uh, hasn't really evolved. And I think guys are very attracted to that logic, sort of the same way that guys always say, I'm always curious about what's underneath the hood. You want to understand. Lesson number four is get creative with integration. In fact, the first time that uh, Rami and I and our two companies worked together was when you know Essence was trying to expand their um, newsletter subscribe base. And we have a, a local newsletter in 19 cities around the world, and we said we wanted to do the same. And the first idea, and it's still a very good idea, was to uh, create a, a fashion giveaway. And that could work well on its own, but it really didn't play into the utility of both sites. We were telling guys what were the new restaurants and bars opening in the cities they subscribe to, and Rami was telling them, you know, how to look great when you go to these places. And until we actually merged uh, those two concepts into our creative and our copy, we didn't have the results we had after. The great giveaway was great, but now merged with these two other concepts, all of a sudden we had something much more powerful. And you know, over two weeks we had you know 13,000 signups, which was 50 percent. 58% to uplift, which is pretty good um, for a short campaign. Another example uh, is when Oswald Boateng, I don't know if many of you know who he is, but he's a very famous designer um, on Savile Row in, uh, in London. And he approached us because he had, he had a new fashion line and he wanted us to talk about it. And, you know, he's also known as a man about town and he likes to party and all those other things. And so we said, well, we can talk about your fashion line. But if we actually talk about you and make you, let's say, a guest editor of our London edition, where you tell us where you go out, where you go for breakfast, uh, where you will get your martini, uh, where you go for supper, all of a sudden you're having a much more natural connection with our audience because you're telling them things about you. And you don't have to hammer someone and plug their, the, their product. People get it. They see that it's natural. They see that... They understand that you're providing them information. And if you want to live like, like Oswald, you're going to go to the places he recommended and you're going to dress the way he does. The fifth lesson is, and, and we've talked about it a lot of times, uh, many times here earlier, you need to have presence on all the platforms. And the thing that I can't say often enough is that your customer is out there talking about you or talking about your brand in all kinds of places that you're not aware of. And there are the outlets that we all know, listed here, and then there are places that are less well known. And the good news here is that all of these places, they're all free. And in fact, from a technical point of view, it's never been easy to set up feeds, uh, RSS feeds or otherwise, to, to have presence on all of these platforms. So what I actually wanna do is just show you guys two of my favorites. One of them is Pulse. Um, Pulse is a place where you can just add a feed and, and it comes in as, as a, a reel, like a movie reel. And you can kind of just scroll through it and look at all the content you want. It's very cool. Why is it important for you to know? Well, 
They really started getting some traction about two years ago, a year and a half ago. They're already up to 11 million subscribers and growing fast. And the other one that's probably better known, and you guys know who that is, Flipboard. If you have an iPad, you probably have the Flipboard app. And if you don't know what Flipboard is, it basically takes uh, Twitter feeds and lays them out in a magazine-like format. And why is Flipboard important? Well, Flipboard didn't really exist two years ago. Fast forward to today, they're worth a billion dollars and growing. And having a presence on all these platforms is not even good enough. And you're scratching your head saying, Jesus, there's so many things I got to do. Now you got to do one more thing. And that's that you got to customize your message depending on the platform. So if you're on a website saying winter code trends in the new direction, that's straightforward. It's what a headline should be. But when you're on Twitter, all of a sudden you have to have a conversation. You have to present the information in a very, very different way. The last lesson is keeping things simple. We're guys, and as guys, uh, we're always pressed for time, and you know we like things that are direct. We understand action, and so in terms of your marketing messages, in terms of your content messages, it's really, really important to lead us to what the next thing should be. Tell me what to do. And if you could do it with humor, as you're leading me along that path, even better. And if you do it with video, then it's game over. But the thing that I want to teach you guys, or, or uh, make sure that you remember, is that online video is a little bit different than it is in, in different mediums. To click away is a lot easier. If you're in between a show that you like and you have to kind of wait through commercials, you might stick around. But online, you're not going to stick around. If the first five seconds of a video does not sell the second five seconds, if the second five seconds doesn't sell the third, the third, the fourth, you're gone. And as much as you create video and you think it's fast, and it's funny and it's short, you have to keep making it faster, shorter, funnier. That's it.